Okay, so um, let's do this. So we're going to do things on YouTube Live. I need to see what's going on on chat. And then I need to send you guys the link here somehow. I don't know how I send that stuff out, though. How do I want to share? How do I share? That's how you share. Oh, boy. Okay, so I'm going to back out of the meeting here. Those of you that are in here already, um, if you go to YouTube Live, you'll see this. Um, let me post this somewhere. Where can I post on this chat? So if you go there um, to that link, you'll be able to get onto YouTube Live. Uh, we'll send an email out here real quick, and it's fun that all this is being recorded. Um, So I just sent an email out to everyone with that. So you guys should be able to get on to that. I'm going to end this session here. Those of you that are in here, we're going to exit this meeting. Hopefully people check their emails. And we should see people coming in. I wonder if you can screencast on this. I'm guessing you can't screencast on this. Hmm. What could I use the screencast? Okay, so we've got a couple. Well, that's good that it's working on YouTube, Sam. Excellent. We'll wait to get a few people in here, and then we'll talk about what we're doing. Um, hopefully people react quickly to two things. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Hmm. Uh, maybe I should stay on go to meeting if People are still looking to go on there. Oh, it's snowing again. Son of a gun. It's never going to end, is it? I should probably spit out my gums. That's probably annoying on the microphone. What all do you guys, Sam and Ethan, what all do you guys see on your end of thing? Oh, we got more people now. Excellent. Is it just my beautiful face and stuff like that? Okay. I'm seeing if I can wonder. No, because that'll just put my face in there. Oh, yeah, I could probably go to this side of the picture there, and then you don't have to see the draft, but there you go.
That's just me missing shots right there. Okay, so oh, we got eight people now. We'll wait a little bit longer as people are hopefully checking their emails and seeing how things didn't work out with GoToMeeting, unfortunately. Um, one by Hefty Ultra Strong. I'm trying to figure out if there's a way that I can put my screen up here so you guys can see things, but I don't know if that's going to be possible. So if there's... Yeah, I I could do a mirror decker there, but I don't I don't see that as being super effective. I'm trying to figure out a program. Sorry, I'm listening to. I'd probably stop my thought in mid sentence there. Um, but I'm looking for a program that'll mirror it on here or onto the camera if there's a way to do that. And so I'm watching a quick YouTube video. We'll see. Don't have those. I wonder if they change that feature. Oh, okay. So the suggestion that I found was do Google Hangouts, but Google Hangouts is no longer, or if it's not no longer viable, it's about to not be. So. We just might have to go with this. Oh, there. That won't do it. Okay. We'll just have to go with this. What's easyclass.com there? I got to sign up for things. Yeah. We might switch over to this then. It might be like the third time's a charm or something like that. If this works better, we might do this because it'll be much more effective if we can see the screen and questions and stuff like that. So, That's just a discussion. Okay, so here's how we'll have to do it. I looked at that easy class. I don't see any screencasting things, and it'll take too long to try to jump through that. And we're at 110 already. We got almost a dozen of you here. So we'll just do things 
uh, on this. And you guys will just have to reference those documents. I'll bring those documents up on my screen so that I can reference them. Um, and we can kind of go based on that stuff. And then if you have a, a general question or, or one additional information on something, then just make sure you type it into the chat. But um, we'll, yeah, just kind of do things that way. So give me one second to bring up those. So we'll bring up the study guide and we'll bring up the, the DBQ. And let's start with the, Let's start with the study guide, and then we'll go to the DBQ in the second half of this, or when we get done with the, the study guide, since that's the more pressing item. So we went over the main points of the study guide in class. I think we got everyone through all the different chapters. For the most part, we rushed through chapter 15, um, but uh, we can jump anywhere there you guys want to go to on that. So kind of first question that comes up on it uh, will be the first question we talk about and then we'll try to address the other ones in in order or if there's a uh, additional question that comes up to that then we'll address that additional question that comes up to the one that we're we're on and we'll try to just ha handle things that way. So anyone got a question they want to start us off with? Well, we're not going to worry about my day, Mr. Matthews, because we just don't have a ton of time here, but um, we'll go with the enlightenment. So um, to kind of pontificate about the enlightenment here, what happens is, again, um, just to do a little refresher, so this might be a little redundant, but just making sure we're all on the same page with it. The enlightenment breaks out of the, or develops out of the scientific revolution. Uh, so you have those ideas of um, the scientific method, and then we apply those to understanding humanity and how we act and interact with each other. And uh, at some points, they're actually really looking for, like, what are the natural laws that guide humans and saying that there are natural laws that can guide us. So that's where you get the discussions on what the best type of government is, like what we have with Hobbes and Locke. They're the early Enlightenment thinkers in, in this realm. Uh, and then that'll develop into other figures. Uh, that will build off of their ideas. So Hobbes and Locke, again, go into that absolutism versus constitutionalism with Hobbes saying that you should have a monarch that is all powerful and um, that people are inherently bad. So that's why you need a, a uh, strong government uh, with one leader to handle issues. And then with that, or like if we wanted to compare that to something that sounds very similar, hopefully to, uh, to, um, to, uh, the the legalism in China uh, when we talked about that way back in the in the day so you can see some correlations that you want to have a strong government there with that uh, and you'll have monarchies especially pushing for that kind of view on things so you'll get Louis the Fourteenth you'll get Frederick the Second or Frederick the Great of Prussia uh, you'll get Catherine the Great Peter the Great in Russia um, they'll come about and be enlightened uh, monarchs in that they are taking the enlightenment ideas and trying to apply them and make their government better. Now, are they perfect in all sense of the words or, or are they perfect in what they're doing and how they're treating people and do they treat everyone well? No, we can see instances of Louis the 14th going and attacking uh, Protestants um, and breaking a, a peace that he had made with the, not that he had made, but that his father or grandfather had made with the Huguenots. And he tears that up and goes and, and persecutes them and kills lots of them. So. They're not perfect, but they try to apply that stuff, and they they really like Hobbes's ideas. John Locke, on the other hand, is all about the constitutionalism, once more of a representative type of government that will protect people's rights because you don't give up all your rights when you have a uh, when you when you set up a government, you shouldn't give everything up uh, just for that safety. And so you have him arguing for for those ideas and that people aren't inherently bad, but it's based on how we teach them. 
And then you'll have a lot of other people pick that stuff up. So you'll have people pick up it like uh, Rousseau, who will say, actually, people are all good in nature and and we need to have more representative um, types of governments. You'll have uh, Voltaire talk about the freedoms that we don't give up. So he really advocates for freedom of speech and freedom of religion and not letting religion repress people and keep them down. Um, he'll really fight for atheism. You'll have Mary Wollstonecraft come up, who's a woman and will fight for women's rights and that, hey, women should be educated. And Rousseau pushes back against her on that, saying, well, women shouldn't be educated because they're just really stupid to begin with. And with that, she'll go, she argues back to him saying, yeah, women aren't very smart, maybe, and that's because you don't educate us. So how, if we took uneducated men and compared them to uneducated women, we're going to be about at the same place. And so um, she argues for, for them being educated and uh with that uh that'll push us up into those guys rousseau and voltaire are really going to push us up into what will become the age of revolution because these ideas will set in motion that governments need to change and people revolt against their government um because Locke says you can based on the social contract or the agreement that you made that you have rights and that if the government doesn't protect your rights then you get a get rid of that government. So they'll push for push for that. Um, and you'll see our founding fathers, people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, uh, Ben Franklin, they're all enlightenment thinkers and building off of that. Okay. So that's kind of the enlightenment in a nutshell. You have these uh, people fighting for rights, um, saying that there are these rights. You also have people making arguments about what morality is and what is the most moral actions you can take. Uh, I believe we talked about the idea of Kant's, and at least some of the class, I don't know if I talked about it in Mall, but Kant's idea is that you need to tell the truth all the time. If you lie at any point, you're breaking your morality because you don't want to be lied to yourself. Uh, people say that goes too far, but um, that's what you have being argued here at this time. And so that's kind of the enlightenment in, in a little bit more depth than what we might have been in class. but but not too much more. If you can remember figures like um, Rousseau, who advocates for um, who advocates for um, gosh darn it, what did I say? Representative democracies and things like that, and for people's rights, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, you're going to be on the right track with that stuff. If you can remember, Voltaire is all about um, freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Again, you're on the right track with that. So. If you can remember those kinds of things of the fighting for the rights and what the founding fathers fought for and why the American Revolution was fought, that's going to be in our next unit, but that's mainly what the Enlightenment is leading up to. So if you're familiar with that stuff, the American Revolution is what fits right right in with that. So that, that would be the Enlightenment. Um, so hopefully that's kind of good enough there. Any other questions on the Enlightenment? We'll stick there for a second, and it looks like a lot of you guys have questions on the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, so we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that, since we got two or three people, or four people. Okay, so we'll assume that we're good on the enlightenment. Unfortunately, like I can't get any feedback. I can't see who's typing, when they're typing, or all that stuff. It's kind of a this isn't ideal for this. We'll have to figure out something better if we have to do stuff like this in the future with more snow days, which hopefully there aren't. So um, the Protestant Reformation. So that again starts with Martin Luther, although it was starting before then with other people that wanted to reform the church because the church had become really corrupt. We didn't really talk about all the corruption in the church, so I'll talk about that a little bit here to make that make more sense because that'll make the Counter-Reformation make more sense. So the church is, at this time, the most powerful institution in Europe, even though it's starting to lose some of its power after the Crusades. Um, people have seen kind of through it, and the the I don't want to say shenanigans they were pulling, but uh, the idea of going for a holy war and stuff like that, people kind of started to see through that, what was going on there, um, that it wasn't really actually the most Christian thing to maybe be doing, as well as they didn't really have a response for why the Black Death happened. And so people started to question the church. Uh, on top of that, you have, I believe we talked about there were three popes at one time. Um, so you have a pope in Avignon, you have a pope in, in Rome, and you have a pope uh, outside of Rome. 
that that third pope that was outside of Rome was elected to try to end the two other popes uh, rule and that didn't happen so you just end up with three and people looked at this as like there's the th those are the biggest instances of corruption that everyone could see there was a lot of other things so in people's daily lives uh at the churches that they would be going into in their parishes they realized that the priesthood was not as good as it should be at times uh, because people were just being appointed into those positions and they were buying that office or uh, whatever the case may be, they were putting someone there as a, a as a um, as a favor and stuff like that. So you have incompetent priests in control. Well, so uh, I'll, I'll go back to that Black Death thing here in a second. So you have priests that don't know how to do the liturgy. They don't know how to read from the Bible. They actually can't even read the Bible. They don't know Latin, uh, and so they're they're not doing the right ceremonies, and that that causes problems. Uh, and, and although people can't necessarily pick up on it right away, the educated people in those areas are starting to see issues with that. The, um, on top of that, uh, of incompetent priests, you also have incompetent bishops and archbishops. You have, in, at times, uh, people buying their ways into, uh, uh, to earn a bishop, Rick, um, and you have people buying their son's positions in it. So like at 14, kids your age or younger, are being placed as bishops and have no idea of what's going on uh, religiously or what really the teachings are other than some of the basics. It's not like they had Sunday school back then that runs you through everything in the Bible. You'd be going to church and it, I, I, I don't know how you guys feel about a, a someone your age running a whole church or being like a governor um, kind of thing. I I would not like to be in that scenario and especially when you have really young um entitled uh people running it um so so that causes issues with people people start to question that like these people aren't competent that are running things and then on top of that you have people buying multiple bishoprics so you, you, if i was really wealthy i might uh buy the i might become the bishop out of i believe dubuque has one here in eastern iowa and let's say i also bought a bishopric in uh, chicago now, and, and maybe the, the bishopric in Chicago is an archbishop, so or Davenport. There we go. Thank you, Luke. So, um, with that, am I going to be in both those places at once? No, I actually also might never show up to my bishopric in Davenport because I, I'm just trying to get the paycheck from it, and I want the prestige that goes with that. But I'm going to be in Chicago where it's much much better, and so you have people pulling that kind of stuff. Um, you have also those bishops, they're supposed to be celibate. Uh, that was a regulation that was put on the Western church uh, during the Middle Ages, and priests are not fulfilling that. Nuns and monks are not fulfilling that. You have in the Vatican rooms dedicated to the Pope's children, whether they're young children or older children. You have at the time of uh, during the Renaissance with... Uh, Machiavelli, when he's, writing, when he's writing the book, The Prince, and how a prince should act, he is uh, talking about the Pope's son, who is going and conquering territory for the Pope, acting like a king and not a religious figure. So you have a lot of this corruption that people are seeing. And the thing that sets it off is, again, that we were in Germany. Uh, the Germans weren't really under a there, there have been fights over who should be running the church in Germany, and they were not thrilled with the Italians uh, running things. Uh, they didn't like seeing their money go away to Italy and not staying in Germany. And so the selling of indulgences just throws things um, kind of over the edge. It's the they're the they're the the, the straw that broke the camel's back essentially. So. Um, you then get Luther being kind of the bullhorn for that or being the speaker for that of, of really setting it off and saying, hey, these are all these issues that I have with it. Now, he wasn't looking to start a whole Reformation movement that changes the whole church. But with the printing press and his words getting out there, it starts a mass movement in Germany that he can't stop. And then that leads us to the, the divvying up of churches. So you get the Lutherans following Luther in Germany. 
you then get other people taking note of that. And so you get Zwingli and Calvin doing that in Switzerland, which no one can really go and touch Switzerland because it's a really tough area to try to conquer and control. And so eh, we'll just let them do kind of what they want to do. And so they, um, they'll they develop Calvinism out of there, which has the ideas of predestination in it, which says everyone's already saved that's going to be saved. And God determined that before they were born or at the beginning of the universe. And Luther doesn't believe in that. He says that's a that's that's ridiculous. And the Catholic Church says that's ridiculous. Um, but this really catches on. So you get the Baptists and the Anabaptists and and the Presbyters, so the Presbyterian Church. All those guys kind of adopt that view of things. And one of those groups that will splinter off from that will be the Puritans that will come to the Americas. Um, and they looked at that as their kind of destiny, and that God had um, made this part of the path to go through. And then. You have them acting as they do of showing who's holier than thou and all that kind of stuff going on um, there. So um, you've got that. Luther says that um, salvation is, is sola fide or only through faith. Um, so that's his argument. And you have to read the Bible to understand what it's saying. So he translates it into German. Uh, the, the Calvinists will also translate the Bible so that people can read it. Uh, this is going to lead to higher literacy rates because people need to be able to read it and understand it. And then the Catholic Church is pushing against this. Uh, they originally just kind of turned a blind eye to it. They they tried to crack down on Luther, but that didn't work. That led to a th 30 years of war. And they thought this would all just blow over, and it didn't. And so then they eventually have the Counter-Reformation where they reform their practices. So they uh, try to stamp out simony. They limit when indulgences should and can happen. Um, they create new orders like the Jesuits to go and be missionaries to bring people back to uh, Catholicism, which doesn't work, but it really works well in going and converting people to Catholicism that hadn't been exposed to Christianity before. And so that's kind of uh, what you have going on there with the Counter-Reformation in a nutshell is you have a, uh, a Catholic response to that and fixing some of the issues, addressing some of those things that were concerns. And that keeps a lot of people within the Catholic Church, which is why it's still the largest uh, Christian church today. Uh, still the fastest growing of the Christian churches, although Mormonism is up there or possibly passing them. But I don't want to get into a whole crazy discussion on the Mormons and how Christian or not Christian they are, because it's a little bit different. But it's a it's a version of Christian, we'll just say for now. So. But that's that's modern stuff. So uh, that was a lot of me talking. You guys had a couple of questions that came up though. So uh, Evelyn's question on the the Black Death, um, people will yeah justify uh, the Black Death based on being on their sins. But when people try to act better and look at um, when they act better and they they're sinning less, we could say sinning less and kind of quotation marks and whatnot. And when they're doing the right things and they see people that are really good people still dying the black plague, they go, ah, this isn't just for the sins of everything. So they they really start to question that stuff because the church has no answer for why this is happening other than it's God's punishment. And a lot of people look at it as God's punishments. Um, if you remember, we talked about the flagellates, they've got the whips and they're beating themselves up going town to town to try to pay penance for that stuff. So yes, that's a, that's a, a, a real view, but also people look at it on the flip side of that is, well, why would you do this to everyone though? So some people will take it as a, as a sin. Other people will say, okay, this is, this is showing fraud in the church. Um, and then Sam's got the question of was being an official in the church. Yeah. So being an official in the church is huge. Um, you, you can make a lot of money. There's, there's a lot of good pay. You're going to be able to rise the social classes and, or social, yeah, social classes. And uh, it's really important for families. So if you know the, um, the Borgias or the Medicis, uh, who are two of the prominent families in Italy uh, during the Renaissance, especially the Medicis are, are one of the biggest ones. They are constantly sending one of their sons or several of their sons or kin into the church to hopefully climb the ranks, become bishops, become cardinals, become popes. Uh, because if your family gets in charge of that, then you have a heck of a lot of power, uh, especially in Italy. So that's what they're they're looking to do. Um, so yes, there, there's a major payoff, especially because usually it's not the first son that's going to go into the cloth. Um, it's going to be the second or third son because the first son is going to get all the inheritance. Um, the second son, they'll usually try to push towards the cloth. Uh, and then the third son will have to go into looking for knighthood. Now that's oversimplified. That's probably too generalized, but 
just to give you some basic ideas there and what's going on, that would uh, that would be what I would say to kind of oversimplify things. Um, so yes, it pays well. Um, probably more in what it benefit though it does for your family is what it is the big thing. Uh, but um, yeah, so the pay is nicer. You can you can have if you're a bishop have a really cushy life. So you're supposed to live humbly and not have a lot of wealth. And this was another one of the corruption things going on. You got monks roaming around in, in fur coats and fur hats and having really luxurious places. And it's like, ah, you're supposed to live a life of chastity and humbleness. And I don't see how having a full on mink coat is uh, being humble. So uh, yeah, that, that, that was part of the issue there is because you could become wealthy. And if we talked about what's the wealthiest institution in the world today, the, the Catholic church is still the top or one of the top institutions that has the most money. I think they are the top but we don't actually know how much they have. Uh, and yes, the church was making a lot from indulgences. That's how they're paying for the new basilicas or the, the giant cathedrals being written, or not written, being built in Rome, as well as they're using it to buy artwork and, and do statuary work and stuff like that. So yes, that's the, the main thing for indulgences is raising money for the church. It wasn't about forgiveness of people, although that's the, the thing that's kind of tied to it. And maybe originally there were, um, but also, I should probably note that the indulgences was a fairly new practice. Uh, if we talk about the church up until 1000, there wasn't really anything of an indulgence that I can think of. There was definitely not one that you could pay for. The first time we actually see kind of an indulgence type thing is the Crusades, uh, when you have the idea that uh, the Pope says that he's going to forgive people's sins who are martyrs for Jesus that die on the battlefield when they go and fight the uh, Muslims or when they're going to other regions and fighting other pagan groups to convert them to Christianity. So. That's really where we get the first indulgences around 1100 uh, CE. So uh, over the next 300 years, they start to use it as a way to raise money to make new uh, churches. And, and the big one being the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, which is the current uh, cathedral that if you went to Rome and saw the Vatican, that's where you would go. Uh, the Sistine Chapel was right next to it. Again, a, a nice chapel, nothing. And it was the, the seat of the Pope, um, but uh, not, not as nice as St. Peter's is. And um, so then government wise with that, um, and then I'll go to the, the Eastern Orthodox Church. So government wise with the Reformation, this this puts major dents in or well, it, it really hampers the control of the church over over governments. Um, that was already starting to happen again after the Crusades uh, and after the Black Death, you have kings starting to pull on and take on that power. The Thirty Years War is fought over who gets to determine what the people worship in their regions in Germany. So the princes get control and get to determine what church their people go to. Uh, so you have that. Uh, it is a major political gain for those that convert to Lutheranism because like in Sweden where they do that or Denmark, they get to confiscate all the church lands. So those church lands become the kings or the princes if we're talking about Germany. And with that, they have um, they get to decide what they want to do with them. So it can be land that they're pulling in more income from. They can sell it to nobles uh, and get income like a, a, a direct infusion of cash for that for their coffers. And so it is a major political um, uh, boon for the people that uh, break away from the Catholic Church because then they get that land, um, which then they can make a lot of money off of, so that improves it. And if you don't have that happen in, like, let's say, Sweden, uh, where I've specialized with some of my history, historical writing and stuff like that, if you don't have that happen in Sweden, you don't have Sweden rising and becoming a, a possible power that it becomes in the Thirty Years' War. Um, you don't have it, especially being a power after that. Uh, where the church is able to to sell that land, or not the church, but the king is able to sell that land and stuff like that. So that's it's it's huge for the governments, and this is why eventually Henry the Eighth, who we haven't talked about yet with the Protestant Reformation, will join it. Um, on top of him wanting divorce, there's so there's two main reasons why he'll join it. Originally, he's against the Protestant Reformation as a major uh, as a staunch opponent, and says uh, Luther is terrible, and he tries to stamp out all the Protestants in his country, but. When he doesn't get his divorce from um, Catherine, I believe, uh, when he doesn't get his divorce from uh, Catherine, he gets um, really upset about the church and says, you know what, fine, I'm going to break away and 
Um, and Catherine of Aragon. And he's going to say, I'm making my own church and I'm going to be the head of it. So he becomes the head of the church, which gives him a lot of power. And the Queen of England today, Elizabeth II, is still the head of the church. And with that, he gets all the church land. So he's able to make money off of that, which he needed to do to revamp some of um, uh, some of the, the English military and especially the Navy. That's going to set up the, the Navy under Elizabeth I uh, or Elizabeth the Great. Um, being able to have a good navy to be able to defend ourselves, although it's not very big, but it's able to defend them herself against the Spanish who come with their armada. And uh, it'll allow her to start setting up some of the colonies in the Americas. So that's uh, the, the Protestant Reformation will severely weaken the power of the church, especially over government. That doesn't mean, though, let me make sure I make this clear, though. It doesn't mean that there's starting to be a separation of church and state. We really don't see that argument coming about until we get to the Enlightenment. That's one of the major ideas of the Enlightenment with the, free, the idea of freedom of religion. So um, you don't really have that happening until then. You can see uh, in these Protestant states, the, the Protestant leader or the, the political leader will become kind of the head of the church or the director of it. So it's a major economic boom, a major political boon for those um, leaders that convert or, or break away from Catholicism. And um, Spain's church was not affected by this. France's church was not affected by this too much, although there were Huguenots in France. Um, and the reason being is that they had a strong control over their church already. So they already had direct, um, maybe not direct, direct control, but they, they controlled what was going on in the church. Uh, so they were able to help have influence or have some influence on who the bishops were. They were able to direct them, uh, the bishops to, to do things. So, uh, they already had control of the church. It's where we see that there wasn't a, usually it wasn't a ton of control where we see people starting to get, um, upset and wanting to break away and stuff like that. So Germany was the key spot. Switzerland also is similar to Germany there. And then you have England being, um, well, the, monarch supporting it and then saying, ah, you know what, I, I'm going to get a better deal if I break away from this. So that's kind of that in a nutshell. With the Eastern Orthodox Church, you don't have, um, you don't have these issues going on. Uh, part of it is there isn't this whole, um, well, there's a couple things. So one, the Eastern Orthodox Church out of Constantinople collapses during this time because in 1453, Constantinople falls. It's still there, but it loses its power and it's under the thumb of the Ottomans. Um, but the Ottomans don't really control it heavily, but it's, it, they weaken. So the, the power shifts to Russia. And in Russia, um, the power is directly controlled by what will become the czars uh, for the most part. And they will, just like we see in Spain or in France uh, or in England, uh, where the, the the czar has control over the church and what's going on, and he's got a really tight relationship with his bishops and archbishops, and so uh, they're able to control things and keep people in line, and they use it as a tool to keep the the people in line. Um, so it, it shares its power with, uh, with the political leader. And actually, we see that, to go back to that, that's, that's happening again in Russia today. Uh, under the communism, uh, they originally got rid of uh, the church, or tried to get rid of it, and then they realized that it was a tool, and then um, under the fall of the communist, um, or under the fall of the Soviet Union, or after the fall of the Soviet Union, I should say, then the church gets kind of separated from the government. And now that Putin's come in, he's really used the church to, to help support him. And so uh, the church is a major supporter of Putin today uh, in his causes and what he fights for and stuff like that, which um, is kind of showing you kind of, or kind of relates back to what we've seen in the past there with that stuff. Uh, and the Eastern Orthodox, it really isn't affected by this anyways, because there are corruption issues, but there isn't the whole swath of issues that we see in the West, especially with people being able to read it. The Bible, the, the Bible had to originally be translated into Cyrillic, which is the alphabet of the Slavic people. And so that was done early on. Uh, with the Byzantines uh, and the, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so they don't see any issue with it being um, translated. They don't see people an issue with people really reading it, but they do need to listen to what the bishops say. And so they listen to the bishops and, and the government supports them, whereas in U Western Europe, governments were trying to break away from the church or, or uh, melded their own ways for the churches that weren't 
getting in line with those princes or other kings and stuff like that. So that's that's why it's not an issue in the Eastern Orthodox Church, although um, I'm going on to too many tangents with that stuff. But today, the Eastern Orthodox Church is having some issues, or the, at least the Russian Orthodox Church is having issues with the Eastern Orthodox Church in Ukraine because of the whole conflict going on there. So um, there are some talks of there might be a schism coming or, or happening there currently. So that's kind of the, that's a deep dive into the Reformation um, or a deeper dive. One final thing I should probably note is uh, for those of you that are religious, if you're um, seven, um, my brain stopped working. Sorry. There are seven sacraments. And so you've got those two, the baptism and Eucharist, and then you have uh, holy orders, you have marriage, you have communion, or not communion, but confirmation, you have anointing the sick, and there's always one I forget, that one of you guys will probably be able to type into the box before I remember it, but there are seven there, and the Protestants go, there's only there's only two that are mentioned in the Bible, so they go with the two that are mentioned in the Bible and say everything else is nice that, the, that they support, but um, God, what's the other one? Baptism, communion, or baptism, Eucharist, holy orders, anointing the sick, confirmation, marriage. I can't remember the seventh one. Let's go to YouTube or Google. Did I forget? Oh, reconciliation, right? the big one. So, um, Uh, I am not going to bring my dog up onto the screen, at least right now. That'll be too distracting. But yes, Baxter, you you, you got me there. So, um, so uh, let's see. Let's go back into things there. So we talked about the Reformation. Any questions on the Reformation? Any final questions with that stuff? Uh, so Asia as in with Christianity or Asia as in just what's going on in Asia? Uh, Haley, I need probably a little bit clearer. We will talk about, um, we'll build off of the Reformation here and, and talk about what Mia asked about, which is what's happening with the spread of Christianity. So we'll get into that. Um, okay. And then we'll talk about the, uh, I'll weave in generally what's happening in Asia with that. So so with the uh, Reformation, you have the splitting of the church, and the Protestants will not really care about spreading the religion too much, and that's maybe being too simple with things, and that, but um, they're not as obsessed about converting people as the Catholics are. Uh, you got to remember, the Catholics just went through the Counter-Reformation. They're seeing people break away. They're worried about people going to hell, and they need to boost their numbers because they're because they want to prove that it's the right religion and stuff like that. And they, they really take to heart with that where the Protestants are more along the lines of not to say they don't care about other people, but they're, they're not really worrying. They're worrying more about their own salvation, especially when you call talking about uh, people that are Calvinists, like the Puritans uh, who say, God's already determined whether they're going to heaven or hell. It doesn't matter uh, whether we convert them or not. So um, you have the Catholics really going throughout the, the world and really trying to convert people. So, we see that heavily in the Americas, uh, in the Spanish colonies in Latin America. It'll happen in Portugal as well, uh, where the Portuguese are, because they're also Catholic. We didn't, didn't talk about them too much with the Reformation, but there, I, I honestly don't know how much is going on there with the Portuguese and the Reformation, the Counter Reformation. But um, we'll, we're gonna, just going to kind of stay off that for now. So, with that, they they really try to convert the Native Americans and the people that do this are the Jesuit missionaries and and their priests that that go to the Americas and learn the culture and try to weave in some of that culture with the with the with the Catholic ideas and the Catholic faith. So you'll see uh, holy sites for uh, local deities become uh, holy sites for Christianity, and usually those deities will be associated with a saint. Uh, that uh, that you would pray to for a similar issue. So uh, let's say there's a there's a 
Aztec god of protection. You might see that Aztec god turn into, or the, the Jesuits say, oh yeah, this is our, uh, this is our Saint, uh, Saint Michael, or, um, I'm trying to, I'm, I don't have much of a Catholic background, so I'm not great on all the saints. Uh, but, um, so whatever the saint may be, I, I don't know exactly what Valentine is, if he's actually love and whatnot, but, but let's just say St. Valentine is the God of love. And then there's this, there's like this Cupid God in the Americas. St. Valentine would then be associated with that Cupid God. And they would start to, uh, use, or they would, they would make praise prayers to, to St. Valentine instead of that Cupid God. So you see them mix those gods or, or try to shift those gods into Catholic saints um, versus them being those gods. So they they make their religions or they, they adjust the religion to that as well as the holy site. So if there's a holy spring somewhere, that becomes the spot for a monastery or a church or or whatever where people can go to and, and they'll pray to Jesus then or the saint there that's associated with it and get the healing or whatever it is that they're looking for. So they really try to mix that stuff, which is then why you have such a um, such a huge following of Catholicism in the um, in Latin America. You don't see the same if we talk about the Western United States or anything like that. Uh, you don't see in Native American culture a lot of them being Christians, uh, and that's because that wasn't really pushed for by the Protestants, and that still doesn't get pushed for when we when we go through actually our push push westward. Uh, with the manifest destiny, this is jumping ahead on things and stuff that you don't need to know a ton. But um, it isn't until the very end when we've put all of them on reservations that we actually go, oh, wait, we should really, really try to civilize them and make them more civilized by bringing Christianity to them and teaching them the ways of the European lifestyle. And so you, you really don't have that push from the Protestants, whereas the Catholics you do. So you see that in Latin America, you see that in the Caribbean, you see that in uh, Africa in some of the areas where they'll convert people on the coast. Uh, and that's what will lead to, in Japan, the Christians and the Europeans being kicked out except for the Dutch because, again, the Dutch are Protestants and go, we just want to trade. We don't care about spreading the religion. Our goal is here is to make as much money as possible. And so they, they focus on that. Uh, the Chinese will focus on bringing in Christians, uh, but they're really not open to their ideas. It's just that the Christians are coming with these new scientific inventions and these ideas and these discoveries and everything else. And the Chinese are going, well, we can actually use these. These are helpful. And so they try to adopt some of those things while listening to the, the Christian stuff, but kind of letting that go in one ear and out the other. So they, um, they don't, um, they, they're not really able to convert the Chinese or the Japanese. Um, they're able to convert people in the Philippines for the, the, the Spanish are able to do that. But then again, that's because um, there isn't necessarily a former religion in, in the Philippines, which is the same as the Americas. So they're able to convert people where there isn't a former religion that has a, a strict um, book about here's everything that you do. Uh, whereas if they try to go to places that are have a large influence of Islam in, in it or the Confucianism or uh, Shintoism and stuff like that, um, or Shinto, I should say, um, you're not able to convert people in those places because they already have their religious beliefs. Um, and for the China or Japan that killed Christians because they didn't say the, the world was heliocentric. Uh, I don't know of either. I, I, I don't know that specific thing. That's not something that you would have to know. Um, because I, I would believe that the, well, I guess it depends on who the, they is you're talking to, whether that's China or Japan. <laughs> but um, I don't, I don't, I don't know that one, Mia, with that. Um, but just know the the Christians will get pushed out of both those areas. They'll get pushed out of China and they'll get pushed out of Japan. Um, because they'll try to peddle their, their beliefs a little bit too much and they won't like that. Um, the Jesuits actually eventually, I believe the Jesuits are one of the early ones that adopt some of the, the ideas. And so, um, I don't know if they don't say it's not heliocentric or not. Uh, I would presume that they would be some of the first Catholics that would actually acknowledge that because they're the ones bringing those scientific technologies. Uh, but the, 
the interesting thing is the the Catholic Church, the head of the Catholic Church, really didn't recognize some of that stuff until much, much later on. Uh, even going up to the present day with things like forgiving Galileo for what he's he said in some of his books. Uh, so, um, I, again, that's probably more specific than actually what you really need to know. So, um, going on to other things here, Caitlin wondering about uh, Australia. Um, not being colonized yet. Uh, that won't happen until we get the second wave of colonization, and that's going to kick off after Britain loses their 13 colonies in America. So when they lose the 13 colonies in America, they go searching for more places to go and colonize, and they decide, hey, uh, Australia is in the middle of nowhere. It'll make a nice penal colony, and we'll send all our convicts there. And so um, it'll be settled by convicts uh, in our next era. And uh, uh, Australia and that region of Oceania there in the Pacific will will start to become more relevant in in that um, in that time period because it'll actually be integrated with the world again. But we still probably won't talk about them too much. You don't need to know a ton about Oceania there. Um, what else was there, Evelyn? Are there? Um, there are never like specific dates that you need to know, but you should remember that like 1450 is when we're starting on stuff because that's when Constantinople falls and that starts when the Europeans start to really push uh, exploring. And so you got the Portuguese going south and around Africa to the Indian Ocean and you got the Spanish going west and running into the Americas. So there's that and knowing Columbus sails the ocean in 1492. So before 1492, the Americas aren't involved with world trade and stuff like that. And so... So you got that going. Um, other major dates that you would have, I mean, I, I don't even have memorized the dates of when the Aztecs actually officially fall or when Francisco Pizarro conquers the Incas. Just knowing that they fall early on here is, is the big thing. And by the, the, in the early 1500s, they're both going to be, those civilizations are going to be taken over by the, by the Spanish. Um, so no, I can't think of any really hard dates that you should remember uh, that you're going to be quizzed on. Next unit, and as we get more towards the present, dates become more and more important uh, than knowing generally what's happening over the time or what the, the progress of things are. So I wouldn't worry about anything too specific there. I mean, I guess the one thing I would say is... Um, by the 1600s, you've got kind of the Enlightenment in full swing there. Um, 1500s, I guess you should know, at 1500, we have the Protestant Reformation starting um, right around there. So if you can remember 1500, that's when the Protestant Reformation begins, roughly. Um, I believe it's 1503 is when he posts his 95 theses. Oh, sorry, 1517. 1517 is when he posts the theses. So... Early 1500s, you have the Protestant Reformation beginning, and that's that's probably the only thing that I would say for the dates. Yeah, Incas, 1533, that's what I expect in 1521. Again, you don't need to have that memorized. If you know that early 1500s, Spanish are conquering all this stuff, by the end of this time period, they control all of Latin America, except for the very uh, southern tip of Africa, or not Africa, sorry, of South America, that actually won't get conquered. Uh, and that's part of Argentina and Chile today, or Chile. But um, so scientific revolution, remember that's beginning um, out of the Renaissance. So we're talking, I mean, if you, if you really want those dates, I would just look them up on Google. So if we did, uh, because I am not an expert in this uh, on dates, uh, but they'll say roughly the scientific revolution goes from 1550 to 1700. Um, it really kind of starts with Copernicus there with his ideas a little bit before 1550, but um, you get that. And then you have uh, the Enlightenment, which will be after that. It'll be coming out about the seven, about 1700 to present, but there are inklings of that Enlightenment before then. Um, so they'll say about 1685 to 1815, but I'm, I, I, I put in um, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke in there, and they're much... Uh, they're, they're sooner than then. Uh, John Locke was in, uh, well, John Locke is right around then. He's 1632 to 1700. So he's right there at the beginning of that. Hobbes is a little bit earlier than that. Um, in uh, the early uh, 1600s, 
to mid 1600s. So um, I, I wouldn't be worrying about dates too much. Um, again, you're not going to, if I'm looking up things or if I'm not memorizing dates and I have to go look them up, you probably don't need to know that, but knowing when things fall so that you have to have the, you have to have the black death and the crusades first, that'll lead to the reformate or the Renaissance. And from the Renaissance, you get the age of discovery with all the exploration that's going on. You get the reformation, um, stemming out of that. And then from those, you get the scientific revolution. And then from that, you get the enlightenment. And then from that, you get the more modern day things, the industrialization and stuff like that. So, um, that's what I would say. Uh, Protestant Reformation is yes. After the Mongols, um, the Mongols collapse before we get to this time period. They're they're gone by the fourteen fifties, uh, except for the Golden Horde, maybe. Uh, the Golden Horde will go to. Let's see, what does Wikipedia say there? The Golden Horde will go to fifteen o two, but that's the last of the surviving. Um of the Mongol Khanates and stuff like that. So, uh, and no, the Mongols don't have any, um, Mongols don't have any influence over the, over Christianity. So Catholic missionaries will be sent out or Eastern Orthodox, but I think they're mainly Catholic because they're coming from Italy uh, as with the Venetians and others that are going and going across the trade routes. Um, so they will, um, bring Christianity with them. They'll bring the Catholic version of it, but they, they don't do anything to make it corrupted or anything like that. Their, their influence on the religion is, is negligible. Um, and really the people that they convert are, are very little. So, uh, we can see them saying, Hey, Christianity is okay to have here, but there, there are not many people that convert to Christianity. Most people again in China are already Confucian Buddhist or, or, or Taoist or some other, uh, Chinese philosophy, or they're Muslim. Um, so that's kind of the main thing going on with those. I think that's going to be most everything that we've covered so far. Um, I guess the one thing I should add, so you get some with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you have... Um, You'll have when the Africans are coming over uh, with the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you have them mixing their beliefs, their African beliefs with with Christianity. And so that's where you get voodoo and other religions like that. Um, so that's the that's the main thing there. Um, if you want to see like a new religions coming about with that, with the spread of religion and stuff like that. Um, Other questions? Any other content questions with things? Am I dog? Oh, we're not going to get over the dog thing. I'll get her. Son of a gun. Okay. Dog people want to see you and make you famous on the internet webs or something like that. I don't know why. I know. It's going to be a rough life. So, um, I'll talk about Wahhabi Islam in a second. So, let's see if I can... Well, that's going to be bad light. But that's the dog right there. Look at the camera. No. No, we're not going to look at the camera. So... So that's the dog. Um, Wahhabi Islam, going into that, uh, it's in the book. It touches on it briefly. It really doesn't fit within this time period other than us talking about changes in religion. Um, so the it's a major shift in the Islamic world. Uh, if you remember, before the scientific revolution, the uh, Islamic world used to be a major uh, hub for scientific discoveries and new ideas. And um, after the Crusades, and especially after the, um, the Mongols conquered the territory, you have uh, 
Islam kind of shutting itself off from science. It's becoming more um, internalized. It's more focusing on itself, not worrying about all the scientific discoveries and whatnot. And you'll eventually get that leading to Wahhabism, which is um, a fundamentalist view of the religion that uh, really limits women's um, rights and privileges that they have. It puts strict. Uh, it looks at interpreting the Quran very strictly um, and having um, a, a strict Sharia code that goes with it. So that's the law code that's based on the Quran, and um, yeah. So that's what you kind of get going on. That doesn't affect us much right now, uh, but the uh, Wahhabi will be a friend of a family known as the Sauds. And uh, you might recognize Saud, uh, or I should say Saud. Uh, you might recognize that name Saud because we now call Arabia not Arabia, but we call it Saudi Arabia because that's the family that's become the most prominent ones because they found oil. And they become the wealthy ones. It became the ones that kind of ran Saudi Arabia after it gets its independence from the Ottoman Empire and from the British Empire. And so um, Wahhabism will become very prominent in Arabia because of that family and will be um, the reason why, or it'll be supported by them. And it's the reason why women are, well, uh, until this year or last year, uh, they could not drive in Saudi Arabia. It's why you see them have to wear the full on um, burqa and why the men have to dress in their way because those are the regulations uh, brought about by their interpretation of the Quran and, and Sharia. So um, I, I don't know how that's like Lex Luthor, though, but um, I would say it's more like it's more like very fundamentalist Christian churches where they do a very literal interpretation of things and say um, that they have, uh, what do I want to say? I don't want to say they're all the way like the Westboro Baptist Church with their beliefs and stuff like that, but um, the Wahhabi beliefs lend themselves to extremism kind of like that. And so if you're wondering what where ISIS gets their ideas from or where the Al-Qaeda gets their ideas from or the Taliban, they got their ideas from Wahhabi Islam. So it, it lends itself to extremist views in, in the faith. So... Um, it seems good on the outside and not on the deep down. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on your, your beliefs with Islam and what you're looking for it to do. So yes, it can look good on the, the outside, this Wahhabi idea. Uh, but then it gets taken down a path that makes it more and more and more extreme, which is like what the Westboro Baptist church has done. They've done, they've gone from and, and, and so the Westboro Baptist Church is like the Protestant Reformation taken to an extreme point uh, in that you have very little interpretations of the Bible because people are able to read it on their own. And so they take everything literally and, and put those in. You get the idea that God hates gays and they're the reason why um, all the bad things happen in America and all that stuff. So um, that's basically what I would say with that. So that's a lot on the content stuff, and that hits pretty much every major thing. The only thing we didn't really talk about heavily were things from chapters 13 and 14, which were things we covered more heavily in our review. So uh, just remembering the colonization of the Americas and the treatment of natives and the differences in the social classes and, and all that stuff is, is a big thing to remember. But um, are there any questions? So if we shifted from the content stuff, are there any questions on the documents or the DBQ that you guys are working through. And then we can kind of wrap things up there because we're at about an hour and five minutes or so right now. Okay, so I did get a question here on the social classes. So what I'm going to do is um, show you an image or share an image. 
it won't be necessarily fully explained, but uh, there are a couple. Hmm. So just basically what it is, is um, you have the, that's not a big picture. Let's find one that's, you have at the top, you got the peninsular. Is there all the Europeans? They're the, the Europeans, primarily from Spain, since we're talking about Latin America, but they could be any, um, well, let's, let's leave peninsulares are kind of a uniquely Spanish thing. So uh, maybe Portugal as well. And that's because they're from the Iberian Peninsula. That's why they're called peninsulares. So you have them and they're the top of things because they are truly European. They are not, um, they are not anything else. And, and you know their heritage is 100% there and they were born in Spain. So that gives them a leg up on everyone. The next class is the Creoles or Criollos, if you're talking Spanish. Um, and and you got, uh, they're, they're again, European descent, fully 100% European, or at least that's what they're supposed to be. And um, their skin is going to be lighter again than those mixed races there. Uh, but they were born in the Americas. So that's the Criollos or the Creoles. And then you got the mestizos who are the mixed creole or the mixed european and native american or uh, indian um, makeup and you got different levels of that so the the picture i sent you is uh one that shows just kind of a basic simple pyramid the next one i'm going to send here or post on there uh gives you like all the different levels of things now it's not really going to explain it it's just going to be kind of artwork that shows that but um, if you wanted to take a look at that stuff and get a better idea of it, that's kind of what we're talking about of, um, what all the different casts or costas are. So the lighter your skin, the higher you're going to be, the darker your skin, the lower you're going to be, but that doesn't, it's not permanently that way. So if you're able to work your way up, you're able to show that you can do good things. You're competent. You become very wealthy. You might go up a couple of casts or become a Creole or Criollo if you're a, uh, mestizo or mestiza. So um, all that stuff is possible to to rise the ranks on that in, in those areas. So um, to finish that, though, we got the mestizos, then we got the mulattoes, then you got the American Indians, you got the Africans below them. Uh, I don't know if fully every time that it was viewed as the mestizos were, or the mulattoes were above, um, were above the American Indians. I don't necessarily agree with this social class pyramid of them saying the Native Americans are on the bottom. I would say the Native Americans are above African slaves just because uh, you're you're in a system of bondage with slavery and, and Native Americans were viewed as more of a, um, a fully grown child. Um, the Europeans said, yeah, you're not educated and so we view you more as children and that we're going to help raise you, which is the whole, that whole repartimiento encomienda hacienda system that we're going to educate you make you christian and we're going to take care of you because that's our job as the adults um because we're european and fully civilized where you guys were not civilized in their view of things so um that's that's the big thing in there i would say with the classes or the castes in this um, if you remember North America, North America, well, let's just go with this. The, the American colonies, the 13 colonies are not that way. They, um, keep race separate because they're the settler colonies. So you have full European families moving over there. It's a, it's a more similar environment to what they were used to in, in Europe anyway. So you don't have as many people dying of diseases where you do in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so you have, uh, less mixing of races and they then try to keep that separated and um, that leads to the, the separate system of you have uh, here's kind of the white classes uh, and they're above the uh, other races and ethnicities of, of classes being lower than that with Africans probably being the lowest uh, after slavery gets formalized um, in the southern colonies and they're also in the northern colonies initially as well um, but that'll become kind of the lowest class there. Um, which still has long-term impacts on America leading to the Civil War. It leads to modern issues that we have today uh, going on with the, with the different races. So um, that's kind of the, the classes in a nutshell. Any other 
questions that we want to go over. They can be content. They can be about the, the documents. Either one works. If we're good on stuff, um, then you guys can like go and make snowmen outside because this snow is super heavy um, or do a snowball fight or something like that. Grant's going to be the one that breaks the awkward silence here of saying, I got nothing. If everyone else has nothing, or if you're typing a really long thing, we'll wait a little bit more, but um, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up there. Uh, my dog's name is not dog, like you guys think it is, but I refer to it as dog because, I don't know, that's normal. Uh, but its name is Brandy. So to answer your question there on that so that we don't get more like that. So, uh, with a Y, and because you just made me say her name, now she's come over and it was like, you have to pay attention to me. So, she might pull me away here before we get done with everything, but not with two E's. So, that's, that's kind of everything. If we don't have any serious questions and whatnot, then... Um, We'll, we'll call it a day, and you guys can enjoy the, the rest of it off. Um, tomorrow, I will not bring her to class. I can't bring her in. She's not a therapy dog. That would be, that would be nice uh, to do that for you guys, but um, we, we got to jump through a few hurdles to get that one in. So uh, one thing to remember is tomorrow, uh, I don't know whether we'll be having an odd day or an odd day or an even day. They haven't sent a message out about that yet, um, but... Uh, whichever it is, we'll be doing the test, and then we'll do the test uh, on Friday as well for those of you that don't have it tomorrow. Remember, the essays are due uh, Sunday. Uh, if you have questions on the essays, don't hesitate to shoot me an email with that. Uh, I've had a couple of you email me stuff this morning uh, that I've hopefully gotten um, back to you on. Uh, so... Last question there, the Dev Shermie. The Ottomans are tolerant. Um, they are still tolerant of Christians. It's just a tax that they put on them. Just like the Jizya that the that Christians have to pay, the Ottomans put an additional tax there uh, to create an elite class of warriors and to make sure they have enough bureaucrats. Um, so um, that's basically what the Dev Shermie is. It's not saying that they're not allowing Christians to practice Christianity. They let them practice Christianity. Just uh, that's That's all fine. It's just that Christians have to give up one of their sons to the Ottoman state so that um, they can fulfill the bureaucracy and other things like that. So it's just an extra tax that are on, that's on them. Um, Christians are just fine practicing what they were practicing. Uh, yeah, so I think this stream, if you need to, whoops, just drop stuff there. Um, this stream should be posted as soon as it's done. Uh, I'm probably going to... Well, I guess I can keep it on public for now. Um, but yeah, it's it's there for you guys. So if you need to rewatch this, um, then feel free to go back and look at any of the things. Um, I don't think I'm going to put any notes in here about when things are happening on this. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be up there for you guys. So if that's everything, we'll call it a day here. You guys can enjoy the rest of your day off. Thanks for jumping in. Um, if you had classmates that wanted to see this uh, that couldn't get on it at this hour because they had other things going on or whatnot, uh, feel free to share the the link with them and all that stuff so that they can they can get on it as well. So enjoy the day. We'll uh, see you tomorrow. If you have questions, come in um, early tomorrow if you want to talk about stuff or review stuff before the test, and, and that should be it. Enjoy. <laughs>